Hello, and thank you for joining today's presentation in the Richardson RFPD webinar series, A Walk Around the Block. My name is Katie, and I will be your Global Spec Moderator. Now let me introduce today's presentation. Richardson RFPD is an aero electronics company. It is a specialty electronic component distributor focused on the RF and wireless communications, industrial IoT, power conversion and renewable energy markets. With its global reach and extensive technical capability, Richardson RFPD serves its customers through component development and selection, technical support, and world-class logistics and supply chain capabilities. Richardson RFPD had a few simple objectives for its Walk Around the Block webinar series. To organize concise webinars of no more than 20 minutes around an engaging topic, make it applicable to the global engineering community seeking solutions for design challenges, and to feed this community's hunger for information on innovative technologies to help differentiate their own products. In today's session, Deepak Ganasekaran, Systems Application Engineer at Analog Devices, discusses design challenges posed by the optimized switching and protection requirements of silicone carbide devices used in the power conversion stage of EV fast chargers. So without further delay, let me turn it over to Deepak. Welcome to our webinar. Fast EV chargers are a major piece of the overall EV ecosystem. The figure on the left is an extract from a published fast charging standard. As shown here, the AC to DC converter and the DC to DC converter are key constants in the system. These converters will also be the focus of this presentation. The table on the right lists few of the published standards. The trend is to get towards higher power charging in order to support faster charging times. This directly translates to higher power ratings, both voltage and current handling capability for the power converters. Using silicon carbide MOSFETs in fast EV chargers has an impact on the overall efficiency and power density of the system. This is mainly achieved by lower conduction losses uh, for third quadrant operation, um, as well as faster inherent switching, leading to lower switching losses on the SIC device. The two circuits on the right side of the slide um, show the commonly used configurations for a PFC stage, um, which is a SIC-based active rectifier, as well as a DC to DC stage um, where a dual active bridge type configuration is typically used. The switching frequencies in this in these converters are in the hundreds of kilohertz range uh, with an expected slew rate on the drain voltage node to be in the region of 30 to 50 volts per nanosecond. This slide um, shows a typical signal chain for EV chargers, um, basically shows all the different um, areas um, which ADI has solutions to offer um, ranges from power management ICs to um, voltage current monitoring, um, error amplifiers, controllers um, to interface and isolation products for both communication and uh, gate driving. Uh, for this particular presentation, my focus is going to be on the isolated gate drivers and the benefits it has to offer for a system like the fast EV charger. I want to talk about the different roles played by an isolated gate driver in a fast EV charger. First and foremost, it provides both functional and safety isolation barriers required for a system like this. It also provides uh, necessary gate drive strength to be able to turn on and turn off a SIC device at required speeds, frequencies across a wide range of temperatures. They also provide uh, the first line of defense uh, against SIC device damage um, due to short circuit faults. The gate drivers also provide low propagation delay skews so that um, low dead times required for PFCs and DC-DC converters, um, especially at higher frequencies, uh, can easily be supported. Um, they also have a dedicated fault reporting and a communication interface um, that can take information back to the main controller to be processed later. And I want to talk about 
a few design challenges um, in EV chargers that a gear driver can help mitigate. First, I want to talk about uh, overcoming effects of uh, common mode transient that cross the isolation barrier during high speed switching. Of the figure on the left is a waveform obtained from a double pulse type setup um, as shown on the right. Um, if you look at the orange trace, um, it is showing the drain voltage um, going from a low state to a high state, indicating a switch turn off, um, going from close to zero volts to 600 nominal. And you can see that the drain voltage raises as fast as uh, 54 volts per nanosecond. Um, and this is pretty fast for a silicon carbide device, um, you know, especially comparing it to an IGBT. Uh, we do expect the slew rates to be in this range for a lot of uh, different switches. So what does high slew rate do? The figure on the left is an equivalent circuit that shows the interface between the gate driver and the sick face leg. The phase voltage node swings to about 600 to 800 volt at slew rates of about 50 to 60 volts per nanosecond. This transient would lead to a current injection through the capacitance of the isolation barrier. The figure on the right illustrates the fact that the magnitude of injection is dependent on the slew rate and the equivalent capacitance across the barrier. This type of injection in itself quite normal and expected. However, we need to make sure that the transmitter or receiver stages of the gate driver aren't overloaded by this current injection. Common mode transit immunity or CMTI as we call it, is the max level of transients um, allowed without the gate driver getting into an erroneous state of operation. This slide shows a few of the possible erroneous states or an isolated gate driver due to a common mode transient. These waveforms are obtained from bench testing on different release parts from a variety of manufacturers. The dark blue trace or the top trace in these waveforms indicates the disturbance that's injected across the isolation barrier. The pink trace represents the input signal to the gate driver and the teal trace represents the output. In the figure to the top left, a disturbance of 120 kV per microsecond is introduced across the isolation barrier. This is using the ADUM4120. As you can see, the output signal does not have any disturbance or noticeable disturbance at these slew rates. This is a mark of a gate driver that has good immunity to the disturbance. The figure on the top right is an illustration of what we call as dynamic error. Here, the same disturbance as the previous case is introduced on a different part, and you can see that the output signal has a large propagation delay, and this is larger than the maximum specified on the data sheet. This can lead to larger dead times in the power converter and could potentially lead to lower efficiency. The figure on the bottom left is an illustration of a timing jitter error. This is carried out using a different part at a lower disturbance of 80 kV per microsecond. The jitter in the output can cause shoot through type faults at low dead times. The figure on the bottom right illustrates what we call as a static error. The output changes state and stays there for a longer period when a disturbance is introduced across the isolation barrier. This can lead to a shoot through and tripping of the power converter. While this type of error is quite serious, this is mostly observed at very high disturbance levels as you can see on the waveform. So the dynamic and timing jitter errors are what are commonly seen across a lot of gate drivers. However, many ADI gate drivers do not show static errors even at these levels of disturbance. In summary, having a good margin between the highest switching transient in the phase voltage leg and the common mode transient immunity is good practice. 
This can help avoid system level challenges such as shoot throughs and poor performance at lower dead times. ADI gate drivers are designed to provide extremely good common mode transient immunity. They offer a significant margin suitable for sick based EV chargers. Next, I want to talk about uh, designing a reliable protection mechanism for the SIC devices in, a, in the power converter. I want to go over a few different example fault scenarios that can occur in the PFC stage of an EV fast charger. Um, three different cases are shown here. Uh, first one to your left is a line fault, in which case the DC link capacitor um, supplies the current through the SIC device into the fault and two devices are conducting at the same time. The second one shows a ground type fault where uh, the DC bus capacitor um, sources this current um, through a single device uh, back through the ground. Um, the third case shows an incorrect gating event or a shoot through event where the high side and the low side switches of the same face leg are on at the same time. Um, so depending on the location and the nature of the type of faults, um, this could have a far reaching consequence on the operating conditions of the SIG device. The currents could be much larger than the rated currents and could potentially cause damage. So when we want to talk about fault tolerance of a SIG device, uh, to do that, we have an emulated fault case here where a copper bar is introduced between terminals one and two. Um, and the high side switch is turned on. So it's going to be turned on into a fault and you can see here that the gate voltage on the green trace goes high, causing the yellow trace, which is the current waveform, to keep raising. Uh, it is current flipped over, so this is raising current. Um, the teal or the blue trace is the um, drain to source voltage. And as you can see, at a certain point, both the current and the voltage are very high. Um, about 6,000 amps and 700 volts um, and it's deep in saturation and within about three microseconds from the beginning of the fault, uh, the device is damaged. So it's important to identify uh, what fault current paths and uh, scenarios that you want to be protected against. Uh, one way to do that is to have simplified uh, models that show the different fault current paths and also model the inductances and the stray uh, elements in the package um, in your overall detection loop. So fault detection loop um, is very critical uh, in determining what thresholds need, need to be acted on. Um, so this is also commonly referred to as a DSAT detection simply because of its um, origins in the IGBT world. And as you can see here, the voltage on capacitor C1, which is the DSAT capacitor, has uh, a bearing on the drain to source voltage or the voltage uh, on the SIG device. Um, but um, one important point to note is that um, the DSAT loop has a whole range of other components who which has uh, their own tolerance and so um, this method shouldn't be at, used for very accurate over current type detection uh, there's always the possibility of the tolerances in the individual components uh, moving the current trip point um, for example um, uh, half a volt of variation across these um, different components would um, due to tolerance can cause as high as a 100 plus amp variation in the overall trip currents. Another important parameter that needs to be considered while designing a fault detection loop is the blanking time. Um, the blanking time, um, if you look at the figure on the right, um, is the duration of time the switch B1, uh, which is the switch that is connected to the DSAT comparator is turned on and the switch is usually turned on during a normal turn on event to make sure that as the drain voltage node on the SIG device is transitioning, um, there is no false positive that is being generated 
Um, but what it does is that it adds to the overall fault detection time if the switch is turning on into a fault. To see this in action, um, the waveform on the left shows that the yellow trace is the gate turning on into a fault. Uh, the teal trace is the voltage on the DSAT capacitor. And as you can see, the blanking switch is on for a period of time where there is no raise in the DSAT capacitor voltage. And once the blanking switch is let go, um, it then reaches the fault detection levels causing a trip event. Um, so the important thing to note is the blanking time must be selected in accordance with the type of switch one uses in their system. And um, it cannot be designed over conservatively, uh, else would lead to very large fault detection times in cases of, uh, you know, worst case situations where your device is turning on into a fault. The other important parameter that uh, needs to be um, selected is the overall soft shutdown rate. Um, to do that, the total impedance offered by the gate driver during a switch turn off must be independent of um, the normal turn on and turn off resistors. In this particular case, the um, area marked in orange um, shows the um, internal FET with a low resistance and an external resistor R3 that can be tuned to determine the required rate of overall soft shutdown. Um, this can allow uh, designs to have varying amounts of inductances, uh, both in the package as well as the um, circuit board. And um, this can be tuned uh, to get the optimal turn off uh, rates that one desires. Here's a waveform that shows uh, the ADM4137 in action uh, on a third gen half bridge SICK module. Um, the rated current is about 400 amps. Um, and you can see here that the device is turning on into a fault. The yellow trace is the gate voltage turning on into a fault. The red trace is the short circuit current raising, um, except that it's flipped over. Um, you can see here, once the gate goes above the threshold, the current raises up and reaches a peak of about 6,000 amperes. Um, the blue trace shows the drain resource voltage. In this particular case, the fault is detected in less than 500 nanoseconds and device turn off is uh, initiated. And um, within a total of 800 nanoseconds, the current goes from, you know, beginning to raise to zero at the end of uh, protection. So the SICK device is successfully protected. In summary, um, ADI offers uh, gate drivers that has uh, optimized blocks for uh, fast fault detection and protection required for a SICK device. Our target is uh, 1 to 1 1.5 microseconds using the DSAT type detection. Um, the comparator delays are minimal uh, less than 75 nanoseconds and um, optimal fault turnoff paths um, also provide a lot of flexibility for a wide range of switches. Um, the next item I want to talk about is mitigating crosstalk between high and low side switches. So what exactly is this crosstalk? Um, so if you consider a half bridge cell with the two SIC devices, um, the turn on and turn off occurring on one switch would affect the gate voltage of the other switch, um, essentially behaving like a crosstalk. Um, so in this particular case, when the high side switch is turned on, the low side switch goes from uh, close to on to a fully off position. And so you can see here that um, the DVDT across the drain to source of the low side switch would then inject uh, current through the reverse capacitance into the gate capacitance, causing the gate voltage to go up from, uh, let's say, a voltage of minus 3. And if the dV on the gate voltage goes above the threshold of the SIG device, it has the potential to cause a shoot-through type event. Crosstalk could also occur during turn off. So in this particular example, um, you have the high side switch turning off. Um, the inductor current would then be clamped by the body diodes of the bottom side switch, um, leading to 
uh, dv dt that is uh, opposite in direction to the one we just saw um, causing current to be drawn out um, from the gate leading to uh, negative more negative voltage than what the gate is already at so if it were at minus 3 this could cause going to minus 4 and minus 6 and so on and could cause uh, potential damage to the gate uh, for exceeding the apps max on the gate one way to solve this um, is to use effective Miller clamping. Um, ADI offers two different types of Miller clamping. Uh, first one is the internal clamp, wherein the internal FETs are turned on inside the driver and you have a low impedance path um, to provide uh, clamping or sourcing and sinking mechanism for the um, DVDT induced currents through the reverse capacitance. The second option is the um, external Miller clamp where a signal comes out from the gate driver um, turning on an external FET that is placed really close to the SIC device, um, enabling a much lower impedance in the overall uh, clamp path um, and leads to more effective clamping. Um, this is of uh, particular use if the SIC device is located far away from the um, gate output. Um, this waveform uh, shows uh, Miller clamping in action. Um, it uses a ADM4135 to drive a third gen discrete silicon carbide. Um, this particular case focuses on the high side turn on. So when the high side switch turns on, the drain to source on the bottom switch is expected to go from low to high. And as you can see during the transition on the blue trace, which is the drain to source, the gate voltage, which is the red trace, um, remains fairly clamped. Um, we are able to limit it within the zero volts and so well below the threshold of the actual SIG device. In summary, selection of an isolated gate driver is an important step in the design of a system like a fast EV charger. Optimal selection can go a long way in ensuring a high performance system. Achieving high common mode transient immunity, ultra fast short circuit protection, and reducing the effects of crosstalk using isolated gate drivers were discussed in this presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for attending today's webinar in the Richardson RFPD, a walk around the block webinar series. Thank you again to Deepak Gunasekharan for today's presentation, and thank you from both Analog Devices and Richardson RFPD for attending today's session. We look forward to you joining our other sessions in this series. Take care, and we will speak with you soon.